Good morning. Happy Sabbath. My wife and I travel here from Tyler, Texas, uh, to give you a little inside information about us. Um, we've been married since August 15, 1982. We have five children, one boy, four girls. Our oldest, our son, is 41. Our youngest is 31. We have 12 grandkids, and one is on the way. So Lord's been fruitful. We're both second-generation Seventh-day Adventists. I am a firm believer in the Bible and the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit is a lesser light to the greater light. And I say that because some churches... They have issues with the spirit of prophecy, but like I said before, I believe the spirit of prophecy is a lesser light showing us to the greater light. Before we get started, let us ask the Lord for his grace and his mercy. Most gracious, kind Heavenly Father, we are humbled to be here. We're thankful for traveling mercies. Father, you have us here for a reason. We ask that you would bless our speaking, bless our hearing, forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, for we ask it in your son's holy name. Amen. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. As was just read, Revelation 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to read the uh, National Sunday Law. How many of us have even read that book? If you read the National Sunday Law, this young lady is mentioned. Her name is Catherine Susan Genovese, nicknamed Kitty. For those of y'all that don't know, she was a bar manager at a bar in the Bronx, New York. And the circumstances that led to her death, psychologists have termed that the bystander effect. She was a 28 year old. Well, she was 28 years old at the time of her murder. But what was so astounding about it was. 37 people listened for a, well, some listened, some even watched for a full 30 minutes for her cries for help, and no one offered help. Now, I didn't say this happened back in 2024. I said this happened in 1964. Now, backtrack. Year 2024. Has earth gotten any better? Society has gotten way worse. This crime led to or helped to create the 911 system. Even good Samaritan laws were passed so that humanity would have some sort of compassion towards their fellow brother or fellow sister. The pursuit of happiness, ambition, the pursuit of financial freedom, relationships, even social media have clouded our minds, have clouded our intellect. I'm especially fond of the graphic there with the gentleman with his phone in his hand because Our society today is overwhelmed with social media, mainly Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. I have a coworker at work. Every free moment he's got, he's on his phone. He's scrolling. He can't get anything done because he's scrolling. And it's amusing sometimes My wife and I, we may be at the mall or at the grocery store and 
Sometimes I'll be sitting and I like to watch people. I kind of like to watch people, the way they dress, the way they interact. And just I just like to watch people as they go to and fro. And you'll see people, they're scrolling. And next thing you know, they trip over, especially if they're walking over cracking the concrete. And it's amusing, but it's also sad because. It's like we're hypnotized by our cell phones. Even us as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Facebook is a good entity, but it can also be. A bad thing. Sometimes I may mention that I'm looking for a specific tool. And the next thing you know, I'm on Facebook And I'm scrolling in the ads is this specific tool. And so, you know, that they're listening, they're gathering information. But not only that. It's the time that we spend. First thing in the morning, see, I'm dependent because I work. I'm a supervisor at FedEx. I need to know the forecast because I need to know if I'm going to wear long sleeves, short sleeves, long pants, short pants. So when I wake up, typically the first thing I do is now, how many of y'all get Channel 7 out of Tyler, KLTV? Okay, so you're familiar with Mark Skirto. Well, I look at the KLTV app to make sure that Mark's going to get it right. So I know how to dress. (laughs) And first thing I do when I open my eyes, I look at the app, see what the temperature is going to be like, see what the chances of rain So I'll pretty much know how to dress. But here's the problem. I get caught up. I'm still scrolling. Something will pop up. I'm still scrolling. And then when my alarm clock goes off because I have an alarm clock that awakens me and then I have another alarm that lets me know it's time to leave the house. Next thing I know, it's it's time to leave. I hadn't had a prayer. I hadn't had my devotion I haven't kissed my wife goodbye and I'm speeding to work. So imagine what type of day I'm going to have because I did not start my day wrapped up in prayer. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transfer transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 through 1 and 2. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. And that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? And that comes to us from Appeal to Mothers, page 29, paragraph one. The first work for those who would reform is to purify the imagination. And see, this is where Satan got Eve. And this is where he gets us It's because if he gets us to think impure thoughts, that's where temptation is starting to get root. So. Trash in trash out. Facebook first thing in the morning. Imagine what type of day you're going to have. You have no no prayer, no power. If the mind is led out in a vicious direction, it must be restrained to dwell only upon pure and elevated subjects. When tempted to yield to a corrupt imagination, then flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. And trust me, that strength comes in the strength of God. The imagination can be restricted to dwell upon things which are pure and heavenly. Now, sometimes one prayer may not do. 
Sometimes two prayers may not do. We have to fervently pray because our lives do depend upon it. Amen. Amen. Many professed Christians do not labor perseveringly. They make too little effort and are not ready and willing to deny self. The prayer of the living Christian will be to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that they may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And I pause with joyfulness because serving the Lord is not a burden. I work with a, I can't, I I know he's a member of a Baptist church. He and I, you know, share experiences, share testimonies, this, that, and the other. He knows I'm a Seventh day Adventist Christian. He also asked me, why are Adventists some of the most sour Christians that he's ever come across. In fact, there was a time that there was another Adventist that was there before I got there. He said, I've never seen him smile. He said, why are Adventists so unpleasant? So I put emphasis on with joyfulness because it is indeed a pleasure to serve the Lord. Continuing in whom are hid all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge because we also pray and even Christ prayed, not my will, but thy will, because what I want may not be what God wants for me. So we have to pray and our prayers must be to the effect of thy will be done. Now is the time of preparation. None need to expect that God will do the work of preparing and fitting them up without their efforts. I'm going to pause there. Imagine a weightlifter or a bodybuilder. He's expiring to build his muscles. But what is a bodybuilder that will not lift weights? But yet he wants muscles. You can't have One without the other. God's not going to do for us, which we can do for ourselves. Now, there's going to come a time where when Adventists will no longer be able to buy or sell, that he will take care of us. But if he gave you the opportunity to plant a garden and you chose not to, don't come begging for food. He's not going to do for us what he has given us the opportunity to do. It is for them to work the works of righteousness and crowd all the right doing they can into the little space of time allotted to them before probation closes that they may have a clean record in heaven. Appeal to mothers, page 30, page 33, second paragraph. The great ethics of the Bible. Loving your enemy. Forgiving people for everything, overcoming sin, etc., can only be achieved by the power of the Holy Spirit, not with human effort. See, Christians believe that it's all about willpower. I know the Ten Commandments. I'm striving. I'm struggling. I'm going to do this. That's not what religion is all about. That's not it's not what we can do. Because if we if that's our Christianity, we don't need a savior. And the second point is. That's righteousness by works. This shows us that the main problem in carnal Christianity is that it is a life solely in human strength. We can't do God's will alone in our own strength because who's going to get the credit? We'll get the credit. 
The credit belongs to God and God alone because it's in his strength, not our strength, that we will overcome. Isaiah 64, verse six. But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Jeremiah thirteen twenty three, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to doing evil. We're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. There's no good within us. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you an heart of flesh. Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Ellen White tells us he who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. Man cannot be saved without obedience, but his works should not be of himself. Christ should work in him to will and do of his good pleasure. That's the point that we're missing. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Will you, will I let him in? Half hearted Christians are worse than infidels for their deceptive words and non committal position lead many astray. The lukewarm Christian deceives both parties. He is neither a good worldling nor a good Christian. Satan uses him to do a work that no one else can do. Paul warns us that this form of godliness written in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, without God's power, without being filled by the Holy Ghost, would be one of the dangers of the last days and admonishes us not to be taken in by this comfortable, self-deceiving attitude. I'm going to pause right there. Two of our son-in-laws are from Africa. One's from Harare, Zimbabwe. The other one is from Johannesburg, South Africa. Back in 2015, my wife and I had the opportunity to visit the Seventh-day Adventist Church there in West Headlands. Now, take note of the shag carpet, the central air conditioning, and the light fixtures. There were three cars, I can't say parking lot because obviously there's no parking lot. But there was three cars. It took two to take our families to the church. And the pastor, he was in the third car. The members, they traveled with their supplies in their hands and on their heads. They had potluck that particular Sabbath. And they, I wouldn't say a second service, but it was something similar to what we would call a Y. And so take note of the pews as well, because the pews are tree limbs. I had to sit back on the rocks because those pews were tearing me up. And I, and it was amazing how they sat there for the entire service and we can't sit in a padded pew for three or four minutes. Their restroom was a hole in the ground. No running water. But yet we see in North America how God has blessed us and we fail to share this message with our neighbors. We fail, we fail to share this message with our co-workers. We come to church every Sabbath And the air conditioning better be working. 
And if it's potluck, the food better be good and it better be warm. We want when we, we want what we want, when we want it and the temperature better be just right. We place demands upon God. When things befall us, when we experience trials and tribulations, we're the first to question our relationship with God. We're, fir- we're quick to question our religion. But yet we see other countries where they have, in fact, that same Sabbath, the pastor was soliciting funds for a evangelistic series that they were having at some nearby village. And to my surprise, this hand went up five pounds of beans. This hand went up five pounds of corn, five pounds of whatever. And at the end of the service, the pastor told us that the conference would take these funds or take these items and then convert it into cash to hasten or to to uh, fund this evangelistic series. And it my mind went back to. When the Sunday law is passed and we won't be able to buy or sell. But we will be able to barter. If you've got five pounds of something, I've got five pounds of something. Hey, at least we'll have something. But we we get caught up. In comfort and we base our relationship with God, we, we, we base religion with blessings and that's not what it's all about. Ellen White says in a dream, a sentinel stood at a door of an important building and asked everyone who came for entrance. Have you received the Holy Ghost? A measuring line was in his hand and only very, very few were admitted into the building. It is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. And we're talking about a Seventh day Adventist church. Third angels message. The testimonies, not one in 20. When God's people are one in the unity of the spirit, all Phariseeism, all of self-righteousness, which was the sin of the Jewish nation, will be expelled from the hearts. Because if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have darkness and evil cannot coexist. So if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's no room for anything else. That's why. If you go to different churches or you go to different homes and there's strife, it's because they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. The early church, if you read the book of Acts, they set this world on fire because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. To follow Jesus requires wholehearted conversion and A repeating of this conversion every day. First thing in the morning. Throughout the day and the last thing at night. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be. Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought In thee. Only those who will become co workers with Christ, only those who will say, Lord, all I have and all I am is thine, will be acknowledged as sons and daughters of God. All who consecrate soul, body, and spirit to God will be constantly receiving a new endowment of physical and mental power. The grace of God enlarges and multiplies their faculties and every perfection of the divine nature comes to their existence in the work of saving souls. And in their human weaknesses, they are enabled to do the deeds 
of omnipotence. A solemn question. Why are the soldiers of Christ so sleepy and indifferent? It's because they have so little real connection with Christ because they are so destitute of his spirit. We know of him. That's why the Bible says, depart from me. I never knew you. And then we'll say, well, didn't I cast out demons? We had a knowledge of him, but he didn't. We didn't know him. There is a terrible danger, a danger not sufficiently understood in delaying to yielding to the pleading of God's Holy Spirit. The sign that we really believe and trust Jesus is that we completely surrender ourselves to him. It has to do with our complete surrender, our willingness to follow him in some things. In everything. God's word is spirit and is life. His word is the only thing that can lift you out of every pit, valley and out of every dry place. God's word is the only thing that can and will complete you. Nothing and no one else will satisfy you. It is the presence of God that your soul is longing for. Have you ever encountered someone that was depressed? Or said that, oh, I feel depressed. Or even you, for, for that matter, have felt depressed. <coughs> well, I'm going to give you a spiritual meaning what depression means. God has instilled in us time clocks where our souls long for him. And if we deny ourselves that Time, that intimate time with Jesus. We become. Emotionally and spiritually imbalanced. And over an extended period of time, that's the feelings of depression set in. So the next time you encounter someone and they tell you that they're impressed, that they are depressed, direct them to have a better relationship With Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. This image, I remember this image in Crater Roll coming up. After probation closes, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. We have no time to lose. We know not how soon our probation may close. Christ is soon to come. When probation ends, it will come suddenly, unexpectedly, at a time when we are at least expecting it. But when we have a clean record in heaven today and know that God accepts us and finally, if faithful, we shall be gathered into the kingdom of heaven. Faith I Live by, chapter 209, page 215. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. And a pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here. And I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. You got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane and I looked at it and I thought, Well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going (laughs) to. 
And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently, and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing, and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? (laughs) Now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head and he starts mumbling and he passes out passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that. Yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, we don't know nothing. Tell them we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell them that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm gonna get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we gotta do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said... I have to follow your voice? Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it, but listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. You realize your head is full of voices and everybody in this world wants to talk to you and everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. Finally, it all came to a stop and the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. 
the voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room in about four in the morning. They knock at my door. And I open the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and he with me and come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and sat down with my father in his throne. Amen. I dear kind Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who's standing at our door, knocking. Father, give us the strength to open the door and let him come in. Lead us, guide us, direct us in all that we do, in all that we say. Help us to guard well the edges of this Sabbath day. Grant unto us that which we cannot do for ourselves, for we ask it. In your son's holy name, amen. Amen.